Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm David. Uh, you may or may not know me. Um, I am participant on the uh, DB8 fans of DBH page. I run a perennial digression. Um, I happen to be really nerdy for classics and early Judaism. So uh, I asked Brian to be able to do this session, and he happily agreed. Um, I thought about the best way to do this, and it occurs to me anyway that probably the best way is to just give the lay of the land with Philo, um, a bit of a guide for the perplexed for anyone who's either unfamiliar with him or um, who is maybe unfamiliar with the time period, the context, um, the Hellenistic period is often sort of not left out, but not covered quite as closely in uh, classical classes, programs, what have you, as are, say, um, Athens in the 5th and 4th centuries BCE, or say the later Roman Empire. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to do a rundown. Um, I've got a slideshow. I'll try to get through it in a reasonable amount of time for questions, discussion, protests, whatever you got. Um, so uh, let me see if I share my screen here. Can everyone see my screen? Cool. And uh, there's going to be a dog in the background making noise periodically. I do apologize for that. Uh, okay. Well, I had to. I had to apologize for you. Okay. Uh, so let's talk about Hellenistic philosophy, which is really what we're talking about when we talk about Philo. Um, so Hellenistic as a moniker is generally used for the evolution well, pretty much everything that follows from Alexander's death in 323 BCE to the Battle of Actium in 31. Uh, so if we're talking about Hellenistic philosophy, we're talking about the evolution of the different philosophical schools during that time. Uh, the two biggest and most influential movements during this period are not actually necessarily the direct successors of Plato and Aristotle. They are the schools of Epicureanism and Stoicism, which we'll talk about. And arguably, actually, when Philo is writing pretty much anything, these are the primary two schools that are kind of floating around in his mind because they're the ones that are popular at the time. Um, Philo is living slightly after the end of what scholars typically call the Hellenistic period, but these are still the popular philosophical schools. Uh, and the debate between these schools is as relevant, at least, for interpreting earlier thinkers like Plato and Aristotle uh, as anything else is. So let's talk briefly about uh, Epicureanism. So Epicuros, uh, pictured here, uh, lived from 341 to 270 BCE, we think. It's always we think with these dates. Um, he ran a philosophical school in what was called the Garden, uh, not far from the Academy outside the Wall of Athens. This was an actual garden. It no longer exists, um, but we see references to it in older literature. Basically, Epicurus gathered a community of friends who were interested in simple living. Uh, Epicurus's direct writing survives in fragments and various letters preserved by Diogenes Laertius, especially in Lives of Eminent Philosophers, Book 10, if you're interested. Uh, and basically, you can break Epicurus's doctrine down to a revival of democracy and atomism. He makes some changes to Democritus. Uh, but sort of the relevant things for understanding Philo here are that Epicurus denies divine providence or pronoia, and he also denies the immortality of the soul. Uh, for Epicurus, the soul is a particular kind of atom that imbues inert matter with sensation. When the body dies, that particular kind of atom filters out, no longer has a medium for sensation, and the body no longer has uh, the power of sensation. So no immortality of the soul. And as a result of this, uh, Epicurus suggests that the, uh, there is this median between pleasure and pain that uh, has to be maintained. He has a kind of ethical hedonism. Uh, of course, because he denies divine providence, because he denies the immortality of the soul, his hedonism ends up getting isolated by his critics in antiquity and sort of blown up into uh, what is often kind of the stereotype or the caricature of Epicurus's view that he was a hedonist uh, in our modern sense of the term. 
Uh, Epicureanism is fairly popular in the Hellenistic period. It becomes very popular at Rome, especially due to Lucretius's De Rerum, De Rerum Natura. Um, the Neoteric poets, including Catullus, and I shudder to include Cicero as a Neoteric poet, but he is technically one, so also Cicero, uh, find various elements of Epicureanism uh, popular and entertaining. Uh, so this is a very, this is a big philosophy still in the first century. Uh, Stoicism starts around the same time with Zeno of Kittium from 334, who lived from 334 to 262. Uh, Zeno is influenced primarily by the Stoics and the academics of his time. Uh, he is also probably influenced by Polymo's pantheistic reading of the Timaeus. So that kind of roots us directly into talking about the Timaeus and reception. Uh, in the fourth century BCE, there is at least one major thinker who is explicitly reading the Timaeus as a uh, pantheistic work. We have this succession of important Stoics in antiquity, none of whose work survives in full, but some of whose work survives in fragments like Zeno, Cleanthes, Chrysippus, another Zeno, Panaetius, and Posidonius. Um, you may have, you may be familiar if you've read any Stoic literature with, say, Cleanthes' Hymn to Zeus, um, very important text, uh, kind of a breakdown of Stoic physics. They're corporealists. Everything is one of two kinds of body, either the active principle, which is also God, or pneuma, or logos, uh, or the passive principle, which is matter. Uh, they do believe in pronoia and fate. Uh, and the soul is pneumatically composed. So the Stoics debate whether or not the soul is uh, mortal per se. There is an afterlife in some forms of Stoicism, particularly for the sage, uh, but that too is temporary because of another element of Stoic physics, the ekpirosis. Um, Stoic ethics focus heavily on tapathe, the passions, and achieving apatheia, um, freedom from the sufferings or the passions. And this is easily the most popular philosophy of Hellenistic and imperial antiquity. Uh, if you are a student of New Testament literature, as I am, this is the most important philosophy to understand for reading somebody like Paul, uh, or even for reading the evangelists. Um, it's not until the second century that we start getting seriously uh, Platonized or Platonic interpretations of New Testament literature. And this is also arguably the most important philosophical school for understanding Philo. Um, now, what are the Platonists doing at the time? Uh, basically, Platonism or uh, the Academy turns skeptic during most of the Hellenistic period, all the way up until almost its end. Um, we get this skepticism uh, starting with people like Arkesilaus. Uh, we get it especially with Carnides of Cyrene who takes it upon himself to argue with the Stoics, and we get it in Philo of Larissa. Um, we also famously get it in Pyrrho, who is connected to, and in, uh, sorry, uh, Sextus Empiricus, uh, who summarizes some of the um, positions of the skeptics and their arguments. Uh, so these are, so basically, skepticism in the Hellenistic period is a way of doing philosophy that reads Plato's dialogues um, focusing on their apparatic character, on their uh, reaching this impasse or this lack of resources uh, to be able to sort of solve the philosophical questions that the various dialogues raise. So a skeptic reading, a skeptical reading of the Timaeus would not take the Timaeus to be presenting some sort of uh, explicit doctrine about cosmogony or about um, theology or philosophy but rather to be uh, presenting and constructing a narrative really in order to deconstruct that narrative from within. It's around this time that we start getting the middle Platonists though. So uh, beginning with Antiochus of Ascalon in 130, uh, dies in 68 probably, uh, we get what I'm calling the revenge of doctrinal Platonism. So this is a return to Plato's first generation of students and their way of reading Plato, their way of interpreting Plato. Uh, we get the incorporation of Aristotle, uh, his sort of retconning as a Platonist. And we get most importantly for our purposes with Philo, synthesis with concepts from Stoic physics, ethics, and logic. 
So a very crude and simplistic way to put Middle Platonism is that this is not only doctrinal Platonism coming back, but doctrinal Platonism that has eaten Stoicism. Uh, and what we find in Imperial and late antiquity is that the re as Stoicism sort of peters out and ceases to exist as a separate school, uh, this is because all of their most important ideas have basically been absorbed and uh, synthesized with the overall middle and neoplatonic uh, way of thinking about things. So two of our most important imperial representatives for middle Platonism, uh, which is a which is a scholarly construct. Uh, th that's not what these people are calling themselves. Probably the classic text to read on this, if you're interested, is John Dillon, uh, the Middle Platonists, 80 BC to 8220. Our Philo of Alexandria, who we're talking about today, and Plutarch of Chironia. Uh, so I will refer to Plutarch just a couple of times in this presentation by way of uh, trying to put Philo on something more of a pagan platonic map. Okay, so that's kind of what's going on in Hellenistic philosophy. What's going on with Judaism? Judaism is uh, a Greco-Roman culture and religion of antiquity. Um, after the death of Alexander the Great, all Judaism is Hellenized, whether it's in uh, Judea, whether it's in the diaspora. Um, depending on where you live, your participation, in Greek culture and society might be more or less. You might have more or less control over what you do and don't participate in. Um, but you don't have a choice really about whether to participate. Uh, that's always happening and it's the only option on the table for most people. Um, there is a transition that goes on during the Hellenistic period from more philo-Semitic attitudes among Greeks towards Jews towards more anti-Semitic ones. So we have a fragment from Theophrastus that's attributed to Aristotle that speaks about the Jews as a philosophical race uh, who contemplate divinity and the stars and devote themselves to ethics and morals. Um, we have other later philosophers after the Hellenistic period who will continue some of these sentiments, um, especially we start getting this idea that Plato and Pythagoras and the sort of uh, hallowed originators of Greek philosophy were really students of Moses. Um, the, these are all attempts both by Jews to find a place in Greek society as well as by Greeks to find a place for Jews in wider Greek society. Um, but there's a transition from this era, which sees, for example, in Alexandria, the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek uh, in the early editions of the Septuagint, the uh, composition of Jewish literature in Greek, uh, for example, the um, the Exagoge of Ezekiel, the uh, various various texts that we now include in the Deuterocanon, like Wisdom of Solomon. There's a transition from this to more anti-Semitic attitudes, uh, both among Greek philosophers and um, and among Greek peoples. In Alexandria in particular, in the first half of the first century CE, there is this growing inter-ethnic tension between uh, Greeks and Egyptians and Jews who are all living in Alexandria um, and with Romans. So at the same time that in Judea, Rome is sort of squashing uh, Jewish national sentiment and uh, Jewish national aspirations, in Alexandria, Jews are being accused of being Roman collaborators by Greeks who are um, unhappy basically with imperial rule and with new strictures around uh, how the empire is present in Alexandria in the first century. This leads to um, insults and mockery directed at Agrippa, who in the late 30s uh, becomes sort of temporarily, he dies fairly shortly after uh, he begins his rule. Uh, but Herod Agrippa becomes the first client king specifically of Judea uh, since Herod the, well, since Herod Archelaus, who was deposed in 6 CE, the son of Herod the Great. Um, this leads in 38 to an embassy to Gaius, uh, Caligula, of which Philo is a part that sort of presents various Jewish sufferings in Alexandria and various Jewish grievances to the emperor um, on behalf specifically of the Alexandrian community, but also referencing stuff that's going on in Judea at the time. This is 
sort of the one big event in Philo's life that we can date. Before we get to Philo though, uh, let's talk about a couple more people. Um, so Jews are living in Alexandria. Alexandria is one of the biggest diaspora communities in antiquity. And uh, we know that Jews are participating not only in civic life, not only in cultural life, but also in intellectual life. Uh, and that means that Jews are around and present for and exposed to changes that are happening in Greek society around how to read not only philosophical literature, but also poetic and mythological literature. So this is the age of Callimachus and Aratus and all of these great Hellenistic poets um, and Apollonius Rhodius um, and all of these great Hellenistic poets and thinkers and scientists and philosophers who spend basically all of their time wrapped in what we could call both the most erudite and the most pedantic form of scholarship. Um, if you read these people, these are people who love to pore over Homeric texts and make the most obscure possible references to uh, Iliad and Odyssey and the epic cycle and to Homeric hymns and to um, Greek tragedy from Athens and to bucolic poetry. They, uh, you know, one example that comes to my mind, Apollonius of Rhodes uh, in his Argonautica in book one, uh, refer uses a word to refer to the infant Achilles resting on the arm of Heron, the uh, the centaur, as his father is sailing away with the Argonauts. The word is epilenion in Greek. It occurs all of twice <laughs> next in Greek literature prior to the Argonautica. Both of them are in the Homeric hymn to Hermes, and uh, both of them have to do with Akithera, uh, with the lyre. So the the implication directly of Apollonius is, is that um, Achilles is like a liar. He's like a kitharos. Is that's or a kithara, Sorry, that's been uh, handed off to um, Heron, but really metaphorically has been handed off from Homer to Apollonius. So this is kind of the quality of the intellectual culture of the time, and into that we do get Jewish philosophers uh, whose works now only exist in fragmentary form, but who are doing the same kinds of things just with Jewish scripture especially some of the same kinds of things they're doing are reading Jewish texts allegorically. Uh, so kind of the main guy here is Aristobulus, uh, Aristobulus in Greek, Aristobulus uh, in the Latinate form. Aristobulus is a Jewish philosopher in Alexandria in the second century BCE. He's philosophically eclectic, it seems. This is how he's remembered. This is what his fragments uh, suggest. He has one fragment, for example, where he makes the tacit suggestion that when the philosophers speak of Zeus, they are speaking of the same sort of metaphysically supreme God uh, that the Jews speak about in their texts. Um, and he seeks to demonstrate, like Aristobulus's project seems to have been that he was trying to do exactly this thing I've already mentioned, demonstrate that Greek culture is really derived from Jewish precedents. Um, he uses Stoic allegory to read the Torah. And modern scholars often treat him as sort of the primary predecessor to Philo and method, the main guy to think about when you think about Philo. Uh, again, he only survives in fragments now. That may well be because uh, his works did survive in antiquity and Philo's were simply considered uh, either to do the same thing better or to be more important. It's always unclear why we don't have something, um, but that is one possible answer. And Aristobulus is also functioning simultaneously with uh, a group that Philo mentions a couple of times, the Fusiologoi or the Fusikoi. Uh, and these are Jewish allegorists who are basically full-on Stoic rationalists and universalists and naturalists. They're trying to read uh, Jewish scripture, not just as philosophical allegory for a transcendent God, which is what Philo does, but rather as allegory for a, a fully naturalized deity, basically, a fully um, And these people may or may not be doing the same sort of thing that, say, the uh, Septuagint translator of Ben Sirach is doing in uh, Ben Sirach 43.27 when he says, uh, Togar pan estinaftos, for he is the all. Um, so Philo uses similar arguments to these people, to Aristobulus and the, and the Pusikoi, but they're not exactly the same. Okay, Philo himself. I promise this was about Philo. It's about Philo. 
Uh, so Philo was probably born around 20 BCE. He lived until about 50 CE. Uh, he was born and lived most of his life in Alexandria, Egypt. Um, in 38 CE, as I already mentioned, he went as part of an embassy to Caligula uh, in response to these riots that were going on in Alexandria. Um, Philo seems to have understood himself uh, genuinely as more allied with the Romans and with the Greeks than with uh, the Egyptians. Uh, now, there are Egyptians who are ethnically distinct from Greeks and Romans uh, living in Alexandria in the first century CE, but culturally they are uh, fully intermixed at this point with Greek cultural norms, with uh, Greek language, with Greek philosophy. Many of their native cults have been Hellenized in various ways. Uh, so it's a little unclear when you read Philo and he has negative things to say about Egyptians what exactly he means by that. Does he just mean people he's living with in Alexandria? Does he mean um, Hellenized Egyptians? Does he mean Greeks living in Egypt? It's a little unclear. Uh, Philo is a contemporary, therefore, of Herod, John the Baptist, Jesus, Paul, and Josephus, um, people from the New Testament and first century Judaism that are maybe a little more famous uh, in our memory, but uh, they, it should be noted that Philo never met or interacted with any of these people. It's unlikely that Philo would have been aware of Jesus or the Jesus movement, um, though I, I should caution and say that uh, we also know less than we would like about how Christianity made it to Alexandria in the first place. So um, as far as we know, Philo knows none of these people. Uh, okay, so Philo uh, had a large corpus in antiquity. What survives to us now is actually a smaller uh, concatenation of his works than uh, what he was known to have composed and then what uh, some people were able to read in antiquity. A couple of his works exist only um, fragmentarily, and we have at least one or two of his treatises that are not complete. Uh, we know that they were originally longer, and we only have about half of them. The one I have in mind specifically is De Aeternitate Mundi, uh, his work on the eternity of the world. So uh, this is not going to be like a line by line exegesis of De Epiphikio Mundi. It's just going to be kind of a highlight of some Jewish Stoic and Platonic features of his exegesis. Uh, and then I'll talk briefly about his influence and then I can be done talking. So uh, Philo strikes, strikes a middle ground between radical literalists and, alleg and uh, uh, allegorists. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, in Philo's lifetime, there are Jews living in Alexandria who, again, are radically allegorizing uh, all the way to the point of understanding biblical commandments uh, to not be literal injunctions, but to be allegorical, spiritual, metaphorical ones. Um, Philo does not agree with them. Philo is an observant Jew. Philo goes to the temple at least once in his life. Uh, Philo observes whatever... Uh, Sabbath and Kashrut would have looked like for him as a first century Jew in Alexandria. Uh, and the, it's also not the case that he is only an allegorical reader of the Bible. Uh, his method is to proceed from and with literal sense unless or until uh, there is a good reason not to, especially if there's something contrary to reason or something unworthy of God, what in later Latin uh, scriptural exegesis will be indignum Deo, unworthy of God. Um, and even when Philo reads allegorically, he still insists on a literal observance of biblical commandments. So the, the best, con the classic contrast here is with his nephew, uh, who ends up being sort of one of the biggest apostates in uh, Jewish history. He ends up, uh, he's actually in the retinue of Titus in 70 when Titus completes the siege of Jerusalem and burns the temple to the ground. Um, so some stoic features of Philo's uh, exegesis and De Opificio Mundi. Uh, the first and foremost, and like the biggest thing that most people talk about with Philo is the logos. Um, so logos is a stoic term. It's not originally a platonic one. The middle Platonists get it from the stoics. Um, and the logos for Philo is the summative expression of God's dunamis uh, or thinamis, if you want to be modern Greek about it. Uh, his powers. Uh, this is the supernal reason or intelligibility of the cosmos. Um, and in Deo Pificio Mundi, it's basically equivalent to the intelligible creation as a whole. 
Um, it's very similar to the Stoic Logos then insofar as like Philo's Logos also is the reason that things are intelligible, is the reason that things uh, are understandable, that our minds are capable of comprehending something about the universe and expressing it um, accurately. But it's dissimilar insofar as Philo does draw a distinction between God and Logos and Pneuma, which appears in Philo a few times, does not play the role for him that it does for the Stoics. Um, Logos for the Stoics is a property of the corpus that they also call Pneuma or God. Um, so there has been, there's a transcendent deity in Philo that doesn't exist in Stoicism. Uh, this is probably influential for the Johannine tradition. This is difficult to say. Uh, it, it depends largely on whether whoever wrote John uh, had read Philo, whether Philo is doing something that is more popular um, at his time than just him. We just don't have the evidence to be able to adjudicate one way or another, but definitely if you're reading John 1, you should also be reading Philo. Uh, another stoic feature of Philo's Deo Perficio Mundi is his cosmopolitanism. So his big metaphor for the cosmos in this text is of an architect that conceives the blueprint for a city before actually beginning to create the city. This is not an accident. Um, this is an intentional metaphor. Uh, the idea is that for the Stoics, the Stoics are the source of our uh, of cosmopolitanism as a concept of the cosmos as a polis. Um, and the, this is what the sage ideally does. For the sage, uh, local, regional, political affiliations are all sort of subsumed beneath like a kind of universal identification with everywhere and everyone and everything as uh, being my city. Uh, the politeia of the sage is the uh, the natural law itself. And so this is exactly how Philo describes Adam. Um, Philo describes Adam as a citizen of the universe. He describes him as uh, having the whole world for his polis rather than um, just a specific place. He also begins Deo Perficio Mundi by talking about Moses as a nomothetes, as a legislator, um, and talking about the Torah itself as like a politeia, uh, as a constitution. Um, and he, he suggests that the reason that Moses begins his constitution with a cosmogony is because Moses is the best of all legislators. Um, you know, Timaeus is not the first listed work in, most, in, uh, in Plato's corpus, um, but uh, for Philo, it's like, look, Moses gave it right there at the beginning. Uh, jumping from the beginning of Deo Perficio Mundi to the end, uh, Philo says, very clearly at the end of Deo Perficio Mundi that he has written the work uh, for five reasons. Uh, first of all, to insist that God is and exists, to insist on providence, to insist on the immortality of the soul, um, and to insist that the world is one. Uh, I'm blanking on number five, but there are five. Uh, and if you remember from what I said earlier about Epicureanism, these are the exact things that Epicureans and Stoics argued about. Uh, Philo is taking a definitive stand here. Uh, he is agreeing with the Stoics and he is disagreeing with the Epicureans about things like providence and the immortality of the soul. Um, Epicure it is not an argument between Stoics and Epicureans whether the gods are real. Epicureans believed in, believe in gods, they just simply don't think the gods give a damn. Uh, again, they're the primary. They are the primary players in Hellenistic philosophy. The Platonists and the uh, Peripatetics or Aristotelians really aren't at this point. So some Platonic features though. Uh, there are some Platonic elements of what Philo does here. So Philo acknowledges that there's a distinction between the two creation stories in Genesis. He's an ancient Jew, so he thinks Moses wrote both of them. Uh, but what modern scholars typically call the Elohist narrative from Genesis 1, 1 through 2, 3 or E, and the Yahwist narrative from 2.4 to 3.24, or J, uh, are visible to Philo as two distinct stories, and he interprets the difference between them philosophically. So Philo says that E's story is about the noetic world. It does not take place in time. He specifically refutes the idea that the beginning about which Genesis 1 talks is the absolute like beginning of time or something. He thinks it is a super temporal beginning in the mind of God. 
And Jay's story, by contrast, is about the aesthetic world, but Jay's story does not describe an absolute beginning of time. We begin in Medea's race in uh, the Jay creation narrative. The world is already there, it's already watered. Um, creation involves the emergence of human beings and of um, the garden and of the events that happen there. So this is sort of uh, Philo's Judaization of Timaeus, uh, specifically the forms, the demiurge and the cosmos triad. Philo kind of rearranges this, and this is indicative of uh, Middle Platonists. He, um, for him, the triad or the the delineation is instead uh, God, the Logos, and the Cosmos. Uh, again, there is no uh, there is no sort of penuma uh, hypostasis for Philo. Okay, so some uh, contributions here kind of across the board. Uh, to Jewish tradition, Philo is basically ignored. Uh, it's difficult to decide why. This could be because there was a massive loss of the Greek-speaking Jewish community in the so-called Kitos War with the Romans uh, in the diaspora from 116 to 118 between the uh, two Jewish-Roman wars. Um, it could be because uh, Christians adopted him basically as one of their own. Uh, thinkers, and this uh, alienated the rabbis. Uh, but some of his interpretations continue to be influential, particularly what he has to say in Deo Pificio Mundi um, is uh, very influential for the rabbis insofar as the rabbis too understand a difference between E's narrative of creation and J's narrative of creation and tend to treat the creation in E as something more of an ideal or uh, super temporal, super spatial uh, sort of creation of the world. And they tend to treat Jay as um, more of an account of the aesthetic world, though even then they're not reading it as strict history. Uh, to Platonism, it's difficult to say what impact Philo has on the non-Jewish world. So he has some real parallels with Plutarch. Uh, so Plutarch wrote, uh, the table talks primarily, but he also wrote a text called the De Isidae et Osiridae uh, on Isis and Osiris, where he is giving a, Hel a Hellenistic allegorical interpretation of the Isis and Osiris myth that actually gives us our early, our earliest kind of um, inkling of the Neoplatonic system of like a transcendent God, a mediating logos, and uh, a world soul in, in Plutarch, but not in Philo. There's like a world order uh, that's equivalent with the Logos in Philo. But Philo does not give us as much about a world soul as we get in Plutarch. Uh, Philo is read by some pagan authors. Heliodorus in his Aethiopica mentions him, uh, which implies that he is being circulated perhaps with other uh, Platonic philosophers. But again, he's really most important and adopted by the early Christian movement, especially in Alexandria where his library would have been uh, sort of subsumed into the catechetical school under uh, Pontinus and Clement and Origen. Um, and so to Christianity, he is essentially the first Alexandrian Christian philosopher without actually having been a Christian. Uh, there are some sort of hagiographical apocryphal stories of Philo converting before the end of his life. Those are not historically reliable, if anyone was wondering. And uh, yeah, just my last little slide here. So uh, specifically in the Christian tradition, Deo Pificio Mundi, if you read it and then you go and you read, say, like Basil's Hexamerin or uh, Gregory of Nyssa's Deo Pificio Hominis or even Augustine's On the Literal Interpretation of Genesis, it is obvious that these people have either read Philo or have read uh, people who are influenced by Philo because they're basically giving Philo's arguments a lot of the time for how to read the creation stories and how to understand their differences. Um, so that's a look at Philo. He's one of these hinge figures in the reception of Platonism generally and the Timaeus in particular. Um, and he is arguably one of the primary people without whom we don't get the Timaeus in Christian reception the way we have it in later antiquity in the Middle Ages. So that's about all I have, uh, and that leaves time for questions, discussion, protests. Over to you, Brian. Great. Well, th thanks so much, David. Um, that was a wonderful uh, <clears throat> presentation. And um, 
yeah, really looking forward to uh, getting into some uh, more of these aspects of Philo and, and the other topics you brought up in the discussion. Um, does anybody have any, any questions on the presentation uh, itself? Just kind of you're wondering something or you'd like to comment on something you noticed? Hi. Uh, J. Edward Britton. Hey, you can just call me Jacob. I, I should Hi, Jacob. Off. I'm not lecturing today, so I should have just used my first name actually. But um, great lecture. I'm sorry I came in late, but I really enjoyed it. I'm really interested in, in Philo. He's one of those like unique figures like Origen who can't really be put in with anybody else. But I, my question is with regard to um, Joannine tradition and like the influence on John, I, I thought – it would be um, in, at the at the beginning of the Gospel of John. He says that the Word, aka the Logos, became flesh. Right? I just wouldn't he have not influenced John because isn't he saying that the opposite is true? So how did he influence John if John, in his very first sentence, disagrees with Philo's assumption about the Logos? Yeah, totally. That's a great question. So uh, there are basically two options here, right? Option number one is either uh, Philo is the earlier writer, and so he influences John who read Philo and then includes John includes Philo's cosmology in some sense in the writing of John. Option number two is that Philo and John are completely unconnected to one another, and John is drawing on a shared concept of the Logos that is shared insofar as um, other Greek-speaking Jews apart from John are interested in it, but not shared insofar as John has a different attitude towards it. Um, I think that we don't necessarily have enough evidence to know whether like the evangelist read Philo and is like, I'm going to take the concept of the logos and apply it to Jesus, right? There's just not like, we just don't know. Um, I do think minimally that uh, when we read John and when we read John talking about the logos, it's essential to also read Philo and see what Philo does with the logos because they do some similar things with it. Um, Especially if you read, uh, I haven't finished his book yet to know if I fully agree with his thesis. I do think there are aspects of his thesis which are uh, good, and Sam actually may have finished it and might have more coherent thoughts on this than I do. Uh, Trails Enberg Peterson uh, wrote a book called John and Philosophy, where he's interpreting John primarily from a Stoic lens. Um, and especially if we understand that uh, to be a middle Platonist is like a modern scholarly construct, like if Philo would not have self-identified as a Stoic, but he's a lot more like the Stoics than he is like the Platonists of his day, right? Um, if we think about it that way, then these are two Jews working in Greek who uh, both have like fairly Stoic ideas about what the Logos is. The difference would be that John thinks that the uh, Logos is specifically connected to the person of Jesus, right? Um, in some way. Does that answer the question? That answers it beautifully. Great work. Sweet. Hi, David. Great, great presentation. Um, so much there. I have lots of questions, but I'll just uh, maybe just start with two that are just kind of uh, uh, digging into a couple parts I didn't quite understand. Um, so the first question was just about um, if you could just uh, dig in, uh, explain a little bit more in that background material about how the sort of early Platonists and members of the academy were, were reading in contrast to the middle Platonists and what, what their sort of, I think you talk about a sort of critical approach, or if you could just explain a little bit how, um, you know, their approach to, 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 uh, to uh, you know, the dialogues was. Um, and the second thing as well was um, uh, in your slide about the sort of cosmopolis, um, you know, uh, if you could explain a bit what, what he would mean by talking about the cosmos as an architect. Um, uh, it, it, well, it doesn't, it doesn't like intuitively strike me as, uh, like I, I, I can't quite grasp what, what that would be. May, maybe if the cosmos was a blueprint, that would make uh, more sense, but even that is a bit odd of an idea to me. So if you could just uh, explain a bit more what he meant uh, by viewing the cosmos as an architect. Totally. Um, okay, so first about uh, the, like a brief history of Platonism. So Plato's immediate generations of students seem to have read him as like having a doctrine of some kind. 
uh, meaning that like Plato in the dialogues is trying to make arguments for things. He is not simply trying to um, sort of uh, bring up questions to which he has no answers, which is actually like a, a really fair reading of Plato if you just read the dialogues, right? Like none of the dialogues end with um, like fully concrete answers to anything. It's always like, you know, Socrates is just endlessly counter-suggestible, right, <laughs> in, in all of them. Um, so after Plato's earliest generations of students, you get this turn of the academy towards skepticism, and that lasts all the way into the deep second century BCE, when Antiochus of Ascalon and the Middle Platonists sort of resurrect this idea of a doctrinal Platonism, right? So for a lot of the Hellenistic period, the Platonists or the academics or the skeptics are, are actually skeptics. They're actually the people who are um, questioning and upending any attempt to come up with a uh, universally rational account of reality, right? Uh, we actually see this in, uh, it's paralleled in the development of ancient medicine. So these are, this is also the time when we're getting arguments between uh, the other usage of physiologoi and uh, the uh, logikoi are the um, rationalists in medicine who are trying to make the suggestion that, uh, you know, the human body has a logos that corresponds to a cosmic logos. And uh, the things that work medically work because there's a logos involved in, like there's a reason, right? There's an indwelling reason that kind of uh, gives all this a, a sort of, it makes it make sense. Yeah, uh, and they are opposed basically by the empiricists who say like, well, I don't know that we can say that it makes sense. I don't know that we can really make the argument that like we know why medicine works, it just works. And so what we do is we just, uh, you know, compile lists basically of what works and what doesn't work. Um, so we see this across the Hellenic, sorry, I'm fighting with my dog as I'm talking to you. Um, we see this across the, uh, across the board in the Hellenistic period are these, uh, these arguments about like, is reality rational? And if it is rational, like, can we know that? Like, do we actually have the resources to be able to know it? And the Stoics say, yes. The Epicureans say, yeah, kind of, to an extent. What we can know about it is that uh, it's like a giant, you know, swerve within an indifferent void in which the gods don't care about us and the soul dies when we die, right? Uh, and then you have the empiricists and the skeptics who are like, yeah, I just don't think we can know. Uh, so that's the answer to the first part. The answer to the that's second helpful. part is, yep. yeah, the, the answer to the second part is connected to it, which is that uh, because the Stoics think that um, the cosmos is both a rational animal and a god, Right, which also Plato says in the Timaeus, right? Um, the, this is part of Timaeus's account of the universe is that it is the visible God, right? So the Stoics would say, yeah, and it's the only God. There is, there's no transcendent creator beyond the cosmos and uh, the cosmos as a whole, when you consider it in its parts um, is like a polis. Now a polis is of course, like a very specific ancient uh, political cultural entity. Like we shouldn't just broadly call it a city, right? It's a, uh, it is a particular kind of constitution in the ancient world. When um, in the Hanukkah story, when uh, the Hellenizers in Jerusalem are asking Antioch to build Antioch in Jerusalem, probably what they're doing is asking for constitution as a polis. Like they're asking for Jerusalem to receive an official kind of political constitution with imperial backing and benefits. Um, now, for the Stoics, uh, because they're living in, they're living through the Hellenistic era, so they're living through a time of rampant imperialism and competition between different big powers. They're also living to see the advent of uh, you know, the Romans and, and all these transformations that are going on in the Mediterranean, they are asking the question, well, what is the truly wise person? Like, what, what, are, what is their political allegiance? And their answer is, well, it's to the universe. Their polis is not Antioch, it's not Alexandria, it's not Athens, it's not Rome. The sage has for his polis the cosmos, right? Um, so it's really about affiliation. It's really about affiliation more than it is like the idea that, you know, like, oh, like the, you know, the stars are like, I don't know, the, the light and sound district. That's <laughs> something, right. Um, so does that answer the question about Cosmopolis? Yeah, yeah it helps. So I'm, I'm wondering if, um, you know, uh, when, when uh, they talk about the cosmos, that would 
uh, maybe correspond in like a Neoplatonic framework to something like the universal soul? Uh, is that a fair? Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and it's uh, probably the case that the Neoplatonists get their concept of world soul from Stoic Panuma. Okay, so, so Panuma um, for the Stoics is like hot, dry, fiery breath. Um, it is intelligent, it's rational, it's what gods are made out of. We're made out of a fair bit of it, which is why we have a kinship with the gods. And some of us can become gods through deification or, you know, at death or whatever. Uh, and that's definitely what, like, the New Testament writers mean when they talk about pneuma. Like, when they talk about spirit, uh, they're talking about a, a kind of stuff, right? Because the Stoics are corporealists. They don't think there's any incorporeal reality. You translate that into a Neoplatonic context where the highest realities are incorporeal um, and the obvious thing for Pneuma to become is, a, is an incorporeal world soul, right? That organizes um, the intelligible content that it finds in the noose into the sensible cosmos, uh, but which is always sort of tensed between the, um, the sensible cosmos, which is aligned with the forms and with the, the like nothingness and chaos of matter, right? That's also what we find in Plutarch's De Isidae et Osiridae. Um, that's how he interprets uh, Tufoyos or Set, right? Um, does that answer that? Or yes, help yeah, with it? I have, I, that leads into another question I had about um, uh, creation, but that goes uh, beyond your presentation. So if there's other people that have questions um, more on the presentation, I'll, 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 I'll pass on the microphone, but thank you. Yeah. Hey, David. Um, oh. Again, present, great presentation. I had a question about, um, like, the Stoic school at the time. So you're talking about how Philo argues, um, you know, for the Stoic point of view against the Epicureans and things like this. I just, I just, I guess don't, I don't know the history. It's like how, one, like how popular and like how is Stoicism like with the common people, with like everybody, you know? And also like how do people know that he is like arguing for, for the Stoic, like you said there's multiple like schools in Stoicism. Like some people believed in the immorality, Im, immortality of the soul, some didn't. Yada, yada. Is there like a dogma of Stoics? Is there like official teachers of the Stoics? Or like how is yeah, this yeah. doctrine, these ideas being like prom promulgated, whatever? Yeah, that's like yeah so th those are great questions. Um, so I would say that dialogue about the immortality of the soul is a conversation internal to an overall dogmatic structure to Stoicism rather than a debate between like rival schools of Stoics. Um, the debate really comes down to if the soul is just panuma tensed into a particular form as like animating the human body, when the human body dies, your panuma returns to the cosmic panuma, like the cosmic fire spirit, whatever, uh, from which it from which it comes anyway. So this is really like, I mean, this is really a monistic question around whether there's any kind of personal, you know, uh, continued existence in a monistic uh, framework. And some Stoics are willing to say yes in, in a certain sense. So like the, uh, the dream of Scipio, the Somnium uh, Scipionis from Cicero is like the best text I can point you to for this. Uh, because in that text, Cicero is representing like popular Stoic views of the afterlife where basically um, if you are righteous and if you are like, if you have obtained virtue in this life, then you will ascend to the stars and you will return to whatever star your particular Panuma has descended from. And if you aren't, then you'll be reborn as any number of like, you know, men or beasts or whatever. Um, so that kind of answers the other version of your question or the other question that you raised, which is that uh, Stoic physics and ethics and logic were extremely popular. They were the dominant philosophy for most Hellenistic and Imperial people. Uh, Epicureanism is kind of a rich man's philosophy, right? It's uh, you know, if you're a neoteric poet and you are uh, enjoying the, uh, you know, beneficence of a rich patron, sorry, that is, uh, it's my child in the background, waking up from her evening nap. Um, you know, if you're enjoying the beneficence of a rich patron who's kind of like providing for you so that you can write all of this poetry and just like hang out and eat and drink and do whatever you want, 
yeah, Epicureanism is a great philosophy. There are no consequences, <laughs> right? Uh, the gods don't care. You like you don't have to be one of those uh, stupid people who like you know actually believes in their religion or something, right? Um, if you're a Stoic, though, I mean, like you're still you still have a more intellectual approach to religion. Like you're still more of an allegorist. You don't you know you believe in Zeus and and Hera and whatever, but you don't believe they're anthropomorphic like you know patriarchal deities who are like fighting with each other or cheating on each other or whatever. You believe that no, these are like cosmic principles, right? Uh, so this is where we get all these interesting etymologies, like Zeus comes from Zao, to live. It doesn't, but like, that's a very nice et etymology, right? Like, um, and this is like what people popularly believe. So when Paul, for example, writes about Panuma to an ancient audience, they're immediately going to think that he's talking about spirit in the Stoic sense, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, that's very interesting. I, I never knew that about that connection before. So that's really cool. Hey, David, I had a, a question. Thanks for the, uh, the presentation. Um, is uh, is Panuma, uh, from the way that you're describing it, is it is it at the end a, a corporeal, subtle substance of a sort? Okay. And, yeah. And so, so for the so for the Stoics, it totally is, and in the Neoplatonists, it remains a subtle corpus. It is the stuff that the the ochema psuches, the uh, the vehicle of the soul, is composed of. So, like in Iamblichus and uh, some of the other Neoplatonists, like as your soul descends into the cosmos through the different heavenly spheres, you sort of take on these different pneumatic or ethereal layers to it. Uh, so who, it depends on who you're reading for like whether Panuma is like a good thing or a bad thing, right? Um, but, and, and it can be both, right? Like in the New Testament, there are evil Panumata. There are like wicked um, spirits, but not in the sense of like an incorporeal being, like literally bad heirs actually is one way you can translate that, right? Uh, it, it just depends on seeing the world, I guess, in a way where like something being a corporeal element, sorry, I'm again, dealing with dog and baby. Um, where corporeal elements is uh, like also an intelligent an intelligible being. Does that make sense? Yeah, and is that so? Is that distinct from ether? In some in some writers, it is ether. Yeah, okay. in some writers, it is uh, Panuma is a sublunary ether in some authors. Um, okay. So yeah, ether uh, Panuma as it exists in heaven in the skies. Um, is like in the celestial regions where the sun, the moon, and the stars are, is Ither. When it slips down into our realm, then it is considered uh, Panuma often. And Panuma, like if you read Galen, Panuma is like a stuff that uh, it's it collects around the eyes and the ears. Um, it collects in like your neurons. It's the stuff that gives you sensation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it is, uh, it is the soul insofar as like the animating principle of the body is how much pneuma you have inside of you at any given time that it gives the soul its various powers. Like, so pneuma as it exists in like a tree is the stuff that lets it like be a tree, right? But pneuma like in a human being is the stuff that like gives a human being the powers we normally associate with human beings as rational animals, right? Um, so Philo is a lot more like the Stoics insofar as like all the functions that Panuma performs as sort of the agent of providence in the world are things that he attributes to God. And so he rejects the Epicurean arguments in that sense. Um, does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. No, I, I appreciate it. Um, I can probably take like like two more questions and then i'll have to i i may actually have to dip a bit early um for our evening routine over here i'll ask what is a very important question then <laughs> uh, with regard to the whole debate over whether Philo's 
primarily an an exegete of scripture for revelation or a philosopher whether that be you know a greek philosopher in some sense um where do you what's your position on that on that question yeah uh that is the big question in philo studies um i tend to be uh i tend to think of philo very much like origin um i think that very much like origin philo understands himself to primarily be a commentator on scripture and i think if we look at his extant corpus that's most of what he is he uses his paideia his um his knowledge of classical philosophy to help him interpret scripture and he has a few treatises that are actually totally devoted to philosophical themes so de eternitate mundi is like one of the big ones on the eternity on the eternity of the world uh, David Runia has made what is right now the dominant argument about that text that it was originally an antilogy, where the very platonic first half of it, where Philo is basically like, here are all the arguments for why the cosmos is eternal, um, are not really what he believes. He's just dialectically doing justice to the position he doesn't believe. And in the now missing second half of it, uh, Runia thinks Philo would have um, un undone the argument. I understand the generic, I understand the um, the classical like generic argument for that, that like antilogies were a thing. And oftentimes we miss the second half of an antilogy because it doesn't get saved. Totally understand that. I think where I depart, and this maybe kind of gets into your question a bit, is that um, the uh, Philo specifically denies the idea that the creation of the world is something that happens in time. Yeah. So if Philo is like a creationist in that sense, he's not a creationist in the in any way of believing that like, you know, the world's existence requires that like it had a beginning in time and space. Like Philo doesn't talk about creatio ex nihilo because it's not a thing at his time, right? So is he doing philosophy? Is he doing um, scriptural exegesis? I think he's trying to make the argument through his work that scriptural exegesis of Jewish texts is a respectable school of philosophy. Um, because he's competing with like a whole marketplace of Egyptian and Greek ideas where like they're taking their traditional cults and literature and trying to do philosophy with them, right? Uh, it's not just Greek philosophy on Greek texts, it's also Egyptian philosophy and Greek philosophy on Egyptian texts too. Uh, so I think Philo is trying to come to the table and say, like, hey, you can do the same thing with Jewish texts. Like, we are also an ancient and venerable and respectable wisdom tradition. And he's doing that at a time when in Alexandria, there is this increasing, like, turn against the idea that Jews are, like, a productive subgroup within um, the, the Hellenistic and Roman thing. And, of course, that's just going to continue blowing up over the first and second centuries is, like, how do... Jewish national aspirations fit into the Roman Empire and wider Greek culture. And those things will also spill over into how Judaism and Christianity ultimately separate from each other. Um, so does that, is that, Samuel, did, did I do okay? Is that okay? <laughs> yeah, no, it's, as I said, uh, because it's a, a broad question, I, I didn't expect anything specific. I just wanted to hear your thoughts. So yeah, thanks. Uh, I can do one more, and then I think I have to think I have to go be a dad. David, I have a question. Hi, Fraser. Hey, uh, good talk. Thank you. Um, so, speaking about uh, Numa and the New Testament and the Jewish or the Greek understanding of it, uh, I'm interested in your thoughts about Ruach, uh, the sort of the Hebraic understanding of it. Um, and maybe if you could talk about the evolution of Ruach uh, throughout the religious history of he the Hebraic thought and how that gets translated or mistranslated or lost in translation as we move from a Hebraic to a, a Jewish culture that is heavily influenced by Greek thought. Does that question make sense? Yeah. Uh, so I would, I would point out first that... Um... So there are three kind of big phases here, right? There's ancient Israelite and Judahite religion. Uh, that's everything pre-exile. And then there's early Judaism, which is everything from the exile to the destruction of the second temple um, in 70 CE, which is a long time. And like, arguably the second phase of that is far more important for Judaism, Christianity, and Islam today than is ancient Israelite and Judahite religion. 
And also all the stuff that we know about ancient Judahite and Israelite religion comes from the Hebrew Bible, which is the like a compilation of Judahite scribes who are giving like their take on what happened, <laughs> right? Uh, so we have like very limited insight into certain things about what pre-exilic religion and was like, but archaeology and like close reading of the texts help helps us to realize some things. Basically, what you have to look for in addition to archaeology is like what are the editors of the Hebrew Bible upset about? Because what they're upset about tells us like what was actually going on a lot of the time, right? So one thing that they're upset about and that they're kind of embarrassed about and that especially later Jews are embarrassed about is that the God of the Hebrew Bible is corporeal. Um, the God of the Hebrew Bible has many bodies. Uh, there's an anthropomorphic body, there's a theriomorphic body, there are like various manifestations to that body. Benjamin Sommer has done the classic work on this. Um, and that means that the wind from Israel's God, right, the Ruach, the wind that proceeds from him is a corporeal thing. Uh, these are ancient people. They're not thinking um, inter incorporeally for like a very long time. So my my wager is that um, Ruach has a concept as like the breath uh, and as uh, like sort of the life force and the wind and the and the whatever, right? Like Ruach is the thing that both inspires uh, Bezalel to help make the tabernacle, but it's also the thing that like comes upon Samson and helps him like kill a bunch of people with the jawbone of a donkey, right? Um, so it's it's really like Ruach, and and today when I was at Kabbalat Shabbat at school, it's the it's the feeling of like being at home when we could finally have parents come in to welcome the Sabbath at school again, you know. So um, Ruach is a very kind of slippery idea. I think for that reason, the Septuagint translators were happy to use Penuma for it, um, both in a context where Penuma had received this philosophical um elaboration is like this is the divine fire stuff that's everywhere in the universe um i think they were happy to pick that just the same way that they were happy to pick like other greek words that matched or if not exactly matched at least like corresponded to concepts that uh they understood to be essential to their own tradition you know so uh does that answer your question now yep, it does I May I piggyback yep. on that just to do like a, a 0.5? Yeah, 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Yes. I'm, I'm sort of curious, right? So how, how do we get from, from this picture, right? to Because obviously, you know, later you get sort of a tripartite anthropology, right? Mm -hmm. With kind of a body, soul, and spirit, or you know, however you want it. And then even, as I understand it, in subsequent Jewish tradition, you get this idea of sort of uh, five you know, right, the kind Anywhere of from three to five different souls. Yeah. So, 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 and, and now I'm obviously some people would say, well, that's, that's a very late development. Whereas of course, people in that tradition know it's, it's always been there from the beginning. The, um, understand Nefesh, Ruach, uh, Neshama, Chaya, and Yehida. And, uh, you know, so I, I'm trying to understand better in a sense, how, how these different, um, you know, conceptions of, 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 of soul or, or, or spirit kind of as, 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 uh, unified or as kind of having these strata, right. Kind of, uh, you know, how, how do we, I mean, what role do they serve? Can we hold them together? How, how would you, you see the, um, you know, how, how do we unfold t towards that? And, and what, in, in a practical sense, how do these different conceptions of, what it is to be an ensouled being impact uh, our our faith and, and practice. Yeah. Um, so I take I take sort of a loose approach uh, to these. So um, let me start by answering the historical question, and then I'll wrap up with uh, kind of the way I deal with this in my in my own life of faith. Uh, so the answer to the historical question is basically that in ancient Jewish texts we have all sorts of different words for the self, the whatever it is that makes it, that makes me me, that are more or less personal. They start out less personal and they move towards greater senses of personality. So like neshama, when it occurs for the first time in Genesis two is just the, like the life breath from God that goes into the nostrils. It has no, um, it has no special 
you know, uh, it's not especially personal. It's not especially like it's not a rational soul or anything. It's just like this is the thing that makes the uh, clay man <laughs> come to life, right? The dirt man, Adam from Adama, like the the dirtling, right? Um, now, in Greek philosophy, you get a debate between the Platonists, who are dualists, um, about this. ah, gosh, sorry. Uh, quickly wrapping this up because I am needed. Um, I would say basically in Hellenistic philosophy, there are arguments about how many different parts the soul has. I think both Jews and Christians absorb those debates. Um, I think the way that Origen, for example, deals with spirit, soul, and body is that he thinks all of these are mind or noose in differing states, dependent on their like closeness to God. Um, I would say that in the rabbis and the Kabbalists, uh, you get these differing numbers of souls to sort of correspond to like differing parts of the person in accordance with um, what those different parts of the person do. But this is also like, this is forged in a context where there's like ever greater knowledge of exposure to philosophy. Uh, this is also forged by like evolving senses of what it is to be human, right? So, um, you know, you could get very Owen Barfield with this, or you could get very, uh, you could just get very classical and acknowledge that like after Augustine's Confessions, for example, we suddenly have a new genre of literature and it's the autobiography, right? And this implies that people are thinking about themselves in different ways. Carol Newsom had a book, uh, I think just from last year on how after the destruction of the temple, both the first temple and the second temple, there are new senses of like what it is to be me that are emerging in Judaism. And so I would say in my own life of faith, the way I deal with this is to just acknowledge that the way that people think about themselves, uh, the way that people understand what it is to be me, changes according to context and it evolves over time in like all kinds of ways. And uh, traditional resources are often useful for trying to make sense of that, but they do like they can have limits. Okay, they can have limits. And I think that uh, what we encounter in Jewish and Christian tradition are like different points where the traditional language sort of meets a limit. And the question becomes, okay, so like, how do we, how do we rationalize that? Or how do we reconcile it? Right. I'd say spirit, soul, and body is one of those where in the East, spirit, soul, and body, like that way of talking about the human person remains very cogent, right, in the Christian East. In the Christian West, there's a bit more of a dualism that emerges between soul and body. Spirit is sort of collapsed into soul, right? Um, so I wish I could do more. Maybe I can again some other time. Uh, I am summoned away, though. So thank you so much for having me. We really appreciate yeah, thanks, thanks. Uh, uh, your time and your knowledge. It was uh, really fantastic. Great no, yeah, thanks so much. I, I hope you can uh, join us again. There's there's a lot more that that would be great to get into with you. So yes, glad you I could hope join so. us. I hope so. And uh, I I think I posted on the fans of DBH page that uh, I'd also like to do something like this around just something purely classical like Homer or something at some point. So uh, details to follow on that. So. Bye, guys. Adios. Good seeing you, David. See ya. Good. So, um, no, that was a wonderful um, presentation. Of course, anybody who would like to stick around and, and chat for a while is quite welcome to do so. Um, I'll just point out that we have uh, two more uh, presentations um, that are uh, upcoming. Uh, one is going to be on the astronomical um dimensions of plato's timaeus and we have a um a presenter for that who kind of specializes in 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 that topic a and then we have uh, a presentation which uh, may maybe maybe ratib if, if you'd like to kind of so on, on the 18th and then uh ratib said perhaps on the 25th uh, how would you describe what what you you're looking to do perhaps with well you said the one next week is by a specialist <laughs> I can assure you the one in three weeks is by a non-specialist. Um, no, I, uh, I, I don't know. Um, Brian has been very helpful and sent me this uh, book, which I confess I have not read. I'm uh, not swamped, but preoccupied with other things that my program demands of me. So, But I have break this coming week. So I'm going to read that. Uh, it's on 
going from the title and the intro on the reception of uh, the Timaeus in Arabic, uh, specifically in, in Galen or Galenic literature. Um, I don't know what I'm going to do with it. So I'm going to read that, read that book. I, I'm not aware that Timaeus is even what was translated uh, or any of the dialogues for that matter, at least in the kind of uh, so-called Greco-Arabic translation uh, movement which took place primarily in Baghdad. So uh, that's all to say it's a surprise to you as much as it's a surprise to me. But I, 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 think I want to try to cover, um, I'll look for things which might be evidence of an Islamic interpretation or something which perhaps differs from, from, the, uh, from the dialogue as we have it. And... Uh, I'll see how much how much I can extract from that text. Ideally, I'd also like to bring in some sort of aspect of Arabic or Islamic Platonism. Um, though, if it's if it's forced, I probably won't won't introduce it. So that's what I'd like to do. I just um, my my uh, if I have any sort of specialization, it's it's mostly in uh, uh, later uh, uh, later Islamic philosophy. Uh, but I'd hesitate to call it that. So. We'll see. <laughs> no, marvelous. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how it it uh, comes to fruition. Um, yeah, and 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 we'll we'll talk about what what exactly what what time it'll be. Uh, next week's presenter is presenting from uh, you know the UK, so we might want to move it back an hour again, uh, you know, just to make it easier on him. But we'll we'll talk about that. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that. We announced that so that if anybody's watching this, you know, we really hope you can join us again for some of these these excellent um, sessions. And yeah, thanks very much.